My name is Rosalind Watts. I'm the Clinical Director of Synthesis Institute, um, Truffle Retreat in the Netherlands. And I'm going to be talking today about psychedelics and nature codes. So first, um, thank you to all these people who have helped um, indirectly or directly with the ideas I'm going to be talking about today. So when psychedelic therapy is effective for people with depression, it often leads to a sense of connectedness to self, others, nature, and to all things. People sometimes describe feeling for the first time that they are, in fact, part of an interconnected web of life. And this is so important in the context of the mental health crisis, with so many people feeling disconnected from themselves, others, and the wider world, and also the environmental crisis, because we can only destroy nature if we don't realize that we are it, that everything is connected. This is a law of life, a nature code. In this talk, I'll mention five of these nature codes. There are many more, I'll just mention five. And they're laws of life, which our modern world has not been built on. In many ways, we've built our society on the opposites of these codes. But psychedelics seem to remind us of the codes. They can they can whisper to us about the laws of life that we might have forgotten. And I think that in order for us to navigate the process of deep adaptations that us, us humans will need to face in the coming years, and for us to hold the suffering of each other with compassion, especially those who suffer from mental illness on top of the challenges that humanity is facing, we will need to align our society more with these nature codes. But I won't speak to that in this talk. Here I'm focusing on the relevance of nature codes to psychedelic therapy. Because I think that if we build this psychedelic renaissance in line with the codes, it offers great potential. But if we build it counter to the codes, it could be negative. So psychedelics have been defined as many different things with many different narratives over the years. But what are they at their core, away from the spin and the different agendas? I think psychedelics are agents of connection because they connect you to your inner and outer landscapes. They plug you in to where you are emotionally and geographically, your setting. All the features of the setting affect the experience profoundly. So in this way, psychedelics are not like other drugs. They do not have any reliable mechanism of action that stays stable across different contexts. If used in a therapeutic container, they can be therapeutic. They can connect you to your deepest pain and your deepest love. And if you use them to learn more about how to make money, they can do that too. And if you use them in a cult to give you more power, they can do that too. And if you use them in a forest to connect to nature, they can do that. Not always, these experiences are unpredictable, but I'd say that the most reliable, consistent action of psychedelics is that they are connectors. They connect you to your intention. This reflection has come from my previous role leading the Psilocybin for Depression randomized control trial at Imperial College London that's just been published, and also from my current role at Synthesis Institute, which is a truffle retreat based in the Netherlands. In the Psilocybin for Depression trials at Imperial, spanning a period of five years, we realized that for people with severe long-standing depression, one or two psilocybin sessions tends to lead to a few amazing weeks or months feeling connected to themselves, others, the world around them, and then the depression tends to return. The film Magic Medicine uh, that was, that was sh shown the first psilocybin for depression study at Imperial College shows that process really well. It follows three of the participants. John, you can see in this picture on the left, and then Andy as well. And John, on the left-hand side, um, whose story is shown in that film, later wrote an article in a major UK newspaper about the incredible change he felt in the months after the trial, but then how awful the return to depression had been and how frustrated he was. I mean, frustrated isn't even the word. How desolate he was that he was unable to access this thing that had helped him so much again. So really, that's why I joined Synthesis. At Imperial, we had a long-standing research collaboration with Synthesis because they were doing legal truffle retreats, legal psilocybin retreats. So I knew that they offered a very safe and professional setting held by very experienced facilitators, much more experienced in working with psilocybin than me. And so I joined them to help build additional structures 
so that eventually some of our ex-participants and other people suffering from depression would be able to access retreats at Synthesis with the safeguards of a carefully held ongoing community. And of course, these kind of truffle retreats are not in the medical model and they can't offer treatment or make health claims. But the group ceremony is the most long-standing, time-tested and frequent context for psychedelics. And it holds a really important place in the ecosystem. And there's something really beautiful about the, the retreat setting as well. Um, you can have you can be close to real trees rather than the pictures of trees that we had in the clinic room in the in the imperial trial and you can have real real fires as opposed to the plastic candles we had and there is a sense of communitas and there's a reference at the bottom there to a paper that was just written by uh, the imperial group using data from people at retreats including synthesis showing that um the the communitas experience the communal experience really predicts um good outcomes that there is something about the magic of the group that's that's really helping people. So back to the nature codes. What do psychedelics teach us about the laws of life? Well, nature code one, everything is connected. In the first psilocybin for depression study, uh, I did some qualitative interviews with all of the participants. So I interviewed them about their experience of the of the trial of psilocybin and how it helped them or, or didn't help them, you know, what, what it was like for them and connectedness was the main theme. So for those who were helped by psilocybin, connectedness seemed to be the main thing that was really happening. And here's some quotes from those participants from that qualitative research. Um, the quote at the top is speaking to like the actual experience of the psilocybin and the second quote is more about the, the effect, the after effects in the months afterwards. So during the dose, I was everybody, unity, one life with six billion faces. I was the one asking for love and giving love. I was swimming in the sea and the sea was me. And then at the bottom, this quote more around the after effects. Like Google Earth, I had zoomed out. For weeks afterwards, I was absolutely connected to myself, to every living thing, to the universe. So after doing that uh, analysis, that qualitative analysis of those interviews, I had this image in my head that people's lives had been expanding in concentric circles, this connection to self, senses, body, emotions, loved ones, strangers, the world, all things. It was this sense of that, like, you know, like zooming out, this perspective getting bigger, coming out of this narrow prison of the mind and connecting to everything. And it wasn't forever. It, it lasted weeks, sometimes months, but not years. But this process had implications for us all because if we can create containers in which reconnective experience can be integrated into our society. It could change our society. So this is kind of my way of trying to describe that sense of the concentric circles, like the expansion that people described, connecting to coming out of the prison of the mind, connecting to the senses, emotions, the body, strangers, nature, and then this kind of interconnectedness that people often feel part of an interconnected web. In my training as a clinical psychologist, none of my teachers had talked about a concept of connectedness. It, it doesn't exist in the textbooks, the psychology textbooks. And at first I wondered if in fact the connection to self um, was actually one thing like self-esteem and that the connection to others was like compassion and that maybe connection was lots of different kind of constructs. Um, but actually I had the sense that it wasn't just connectedness to self being different to connectedness to others. I had a sense it was all part of the same underlying construct, that connecting to yourself and others and nature and spirituality was all connected, all part of the same process, that it was a process of being connected, being opened up. John, who you saw the photo of um, from the first study, participating in the first study, called it uh, this process, he called it turning on the lights in a dark house. And it doesn't last forever. The lights dim again over weeks and months. But it seemed like a fundamental state change because with the lights on, you can connect to everything around you. You can see things and you can experience greater connectedness, general connectedness. So I developed a measure to measure this thing that we were witnessing in the first trial and the second trial and to see if data would support one underlying construct. The connectedness increases after psychedelics generally across the board, so it increases on all these different domains and includes the sense of interconnectedness. So 
we validated um, the measure by including it in a very large survey study of people having psychedelic experiences on retreats. Many of those were at synthesis. And we found it to be a reliable measure. Um, the construct of connectedness had internal and external validity, which means that the construct is one thing and not many different things, and that the construct is distinct from other similar constructs. So it was valid and reliable. And this is the, the, the measure. The validation paper is going to be published very soon. Um, and indeed, we included this in this large survey study of people in retreat. So it's not a psychiatric population, but a relatively high incidence of people with some addiction or mild depression and anxiety, things like that. We found um, from that large survey that if people experience one type of connectedness increasing after a psychedelic retreat, they tended to experience all types. So there was this evidence for this general connectedness of self, others, and world all uh, increasing. So what we were looking at was a kind of general connectedness. And in the wake of a retreat, scores on connecting to self, so I think connection, you can see all the different colors in the different domains there, connection to self and connection to others and connection to world were all going up and staying up. And this is a, a non-psychiatric population. You can see that and the schools were staying up for a long time, up to like, you know, not decreasing that much at the six month point. And also we included this measure in the psilocybin for depression study that's just been published. So that was a randomized control trial comparing high dose psilocybin to an SSRI. And on the main outcome measure of this study, which was depression ratings, psilocybin wasn't superior to SSRI. So there was no significant difference between the SSRI group and the high dose psilocybin group. Both groups were really helped. And I think that might be because both groups, the SSRI group and the high dose psilocybin group, both went through the therapeutic protocol. So it was lots of therapy sessions. So we weren't surprised that both groups were really helped by the, by the intervention. But what was so interesting is what di did differentiate between the two groups. So the SSRI group that had lots of therapy and the psilocybin group that had lots of therapy, what did differentiate them was their connectedness scores. Because both of the groups, their depression scores went down and both groups' connected score connectedness scores went up. But the psilocybin group had much higher, significantly higher scores on connectedness. So it's connectedness is really differentiating these two groups. And you can see they're in that graph, time one and time two. And the psilocybin group had much, much higher scores on the um, on the connected as measure. So what they had more of was this. All of these items in the connectedness measure, the psilocybin group had more of this. And I think now the next step is to ask the question of whether these connectedness scores would increase even more if done in a group of people with depression in nature. And I think they would rather than in a room. Um, with pictures of trees, I think doing it in a group in nature, I think those scores would go up even more. So psychedelics can make us more connected. They can align us with the earth code of connectedness. Psychedelics can wrench us out of our little individual prisons and they can open us up to the everything. And I think this multidimensional general connectedness can be summarized using the metaphor of a tree. You think about a tree, the tree trunk is the connection to the self, the body, emotions, the branches, connection to the world, connection to values, purpose, interconnectedness, interconnectedness in the ecosystem. And then the roots, the mycelium that connects all the roots of the trees, that's connection to others. Because the way the trees connect with the mycelium, they share resources, they take care of them, each other. And that's something about our own connection to each other that we might not feel, might not see it, it's underground, but it's there, it holds us. It's the ground on which we stand even if we can't see it or feel it, it's there. But what about the psychedelic renaissance? Is that guided by this principle of everything being connected? Are we working together like trees in a forest, connected by the mycelium below us, sharing resources? I think we can learn a lot from Oregon because they have a real sense of an ecosystem working together for the same values. And those values are about maximizing the therapeutic potential of psilocybin. And I think we can support you, Sona and Max, who are also working with these same values. And Bennett Zellner's pollinator approach is all about connectedness, connectedness for the greater good, connecting a psychedelic center with a local ecosystem, which is the pollinator approach. 
And I would like to see the creation of a platform for retreats to share outcome measures and for retreats to share adverse events data, just information about what they're experiencing and seeing. Because I think that if we connected up all the retreats, I think we would be stronger and safer and wiser. We could learn so much if we shared. And using the same outcome measures would mean that we had a huge data set for um, field-based research. So now onto the second nature code, balance and homeostasis. So homeostasis in nature means that the earth is a self-regulating system. There is an interplay of opposites working together. In psychedelic experiences, we often have that sense that there is an innate mechanism in the body, which when accessed, brings balance to the person system. Stanislav Roth talked about the homeostatic mechanism. Often the parts of ourselves that have been most abandoned or resisted or hidden come springing into life in a psychedelic session. What is out of balance is brought into balance, sometimes in painful ways. Often, we've been so in our heads and in the session, our heart speaks. We've been so busy doing and now it's time for being. We've been thinking so much and now we just feel. And finding this balance between the rational and the emotional is really core to us as humans. And it's perhaps at the root of one of the oldest stories. So Ian Siddons Hegenworth, who's an author that I really like, is an ecotherapist, talks about how in the Bible story of the Garden of Eden, there are two trees joined at the same root, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. And he brings up the idea that this could be a metaphor for the development of consciousness within the womb. The womb is the Garden of Eden, the two trees, two halves of the brain, both joined at the same root. The tree of knowledge is the rational inquiring left brain, and the tree of life is the intuitive, receptive right brain. And the story tells us that innocence is lost when Adam and Eve eat from the tree of knowledge and the spiral of learning begins. So if the tree of knowledge is about doing, the tree of life is about being. Adam and Eve become too focused on doing, too hungry for advancement. But in nature, these two opposing forces are held in balance continually the active principle and the passive principle. You could also call it the masculine and the feminine. And I'm not necessarily talking about men and women. Some women have a lot of masculine, I think I do. And some men have a lot of feminine. But in nature, masculine and feminine are held in balance. And that is where life springs from. And in the context of psychedelic therapy, psychedelics often seem to invite in more of the feminine. They've been called femtheogens. Maria Papaspiri calls them that in this, in this lovely book. And they can help us access the feeling, sensing, emotional parts of us, the parts that we've often had to shut off in our predominantly masculine principle culture. So in our current culture, which values achieving, striving, being the best, many of us really need to access more and nurture more our feminine aspects, feeling the body, senses, intuition, emotions, vulnerability. And so often that's what a session brings us. We can cry, we can really feel. So I would say that psychedelics can help us balance the masculine and feminine parts of ourselves. But do we align with this need for the yin and the yang in the Western psychedelic renaissance? So this is a picture that was made recently about the most influential people in psychedelics. It was made, it was in the context of uh, raising, uh, funding psychedelics investments. Um, now I'm sure many of these men are deeply in touch with their feminine. I'm sure they are. I'm not talking about the individuals at all, but are we in balance? Is there something wrong with this picture? I'll talk about diversity later because all these men are white, but here I'm just looking at the lack of balance in the perceived influence of men and women in this field and how glaringly out of sync with the nature codes we are here, how far we have strayed. Valentina Wasson was the first Westerner to find magic mushrooms in Mexico, where the tradition was of mainly women mushroom women healers. Maria Sabina was the healer who provided the magic mushrooms that led to psilocybin being synthesized in a Swiss lab, which is the basis for all the uh, research. Amanda Fielding initiated the research project at Imperial College. She was working on protocols for studying psychedelics 
and testing her own hypotheses decades ago. And she donated lots of the money to get the research program going. And these are just a few of the women who've been instrumental to this field, who have been key in developing something they believed would help people, often quite quietly behind the scenes. And so I made an alternative image uh, just to bring some balance to the picture. And this is just some of the women in psychedelics that I know. It's not an exhausted, it's just, yeah, it, it's meant to, be, to represent something rather than being exhausted uh, summary. But it, it made me happy to make this picture. And related to this idea of having our masculine and feminine out of balance in terms of gender and representation, I would say the psychedelics mainstream is moving towards the masculine principle in other more subtle ways too. Right now, we, we fetishize science and the medical setting, and we undervalue retreats in indigenous settings. In clinical trials, we focus on the data extraction, but we forget the aftercare of those that we extracted the data from. I think we also overvalue quantitative data and numbers and undervalue qualitative data, participants' own narratives. I think perhaps we overvalue the neuroscience aspects and undervalue the therapy aspects. But the main thing we are doing is talking about psilocybin as if it is a drug. And we're doing that because in order to get it approved, it has to go through the FDA and the EMA, and these systems are set up to approve and regulate drugs. So in psychedelic clinical trials, we are playing by the rules of that game. In the psilocybin for depression study at Imperial, this, this one that's just been published, we worked with every person on a long, carefully curated therapeutic journey with many sessions, sessions with other one or two therapists, many aftercare sessions. And often it was like, you know, up to 30, 40 hours of, of, of time with, with sometimes two therapists in all those sessions. And yet in the write-up, because of the restrictions around how to write up drug trials, it's reported like a, a trial of, of an SSRI, escitalopram versus psilocybin, as if they are just two different chemicals without acknowledgement of the therapy. The only mention of the therapy was in the appendix because that's the structure, that's how it works. And so the lived experience of our team of therapists who ran the trial was that it was all about human connection and nurturing presence. And yet those elements were relegated to an afterthought, the supplementary material. So what can we do? Well, I think clinical research teams can think a bit about how to hold the drug aspects and the therapy aspects in balance and how to communicate that in the write-ups. There must be a way. And if there isn't a way right now, a way needs to be made, even small steps in that direction with the intention of bringing balance. We can change the narrative in the media. Research teams can inform journalists about the importance of the therapy, emphasize that it's not simply a brain reset. I mean, the idea of a brain reset that's so popular in the media is a bit ridiculous. If it was a brain reset, we'd have hundreds of thousands of people at music festivals suddenly cured of all their ills. We can also do more qualitative research. We can ask participants about their views more. And I think we can question the randomized control trial model. Is this really the only way to prove that psychedelics work? And we can do field-based research on retreats in indigenous settings who are interested in being part of the research. And finally, I think we can give women in the field the recognition they deserve and more space to influence. So now on to the third nature code. A cycle of light and dark rules all nature. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. Morning, afternoon, evening, night. In the UK, every November, trees lose their leaves and become compost for the seed that they will also drop soon. Cycles of decay and renewal are inherent in natural growth. Yet in our culture, we tend to avoid, deny or oppress the dark half of the cycle, the loss, the decay, the pain. And I think we lack the social structures needed to embrace pain and darkness in community with each other. There are lots of ways as a society when we want to stay in constant summer and our relationship with psychedelics reflects this. In our hunger, 
for psilocybin to be a cure for depression, a brain reset, the old brain reset. But I want it to be a magic fix. I think we are avoiding two different types of darkness. One is when the trip is traumatic and people struggle to integrate it. So I've seen a fair bit of this, mainly in the psychedelic integration group in London that Michelle Baker Jones and I set up about four years ago. Um, when people were doing it alone, often inspired by the headlines. So they'd see the headlines about the reset and how it could cure depression. And they would, I guess, kind of self-medicate without any screening or preparation or guidance during the trip or support afterwards. They would take very high doses alone. And they had some really harrowing experiences that plagued them for a long time afterwards. And as psychedelics hit the mainstream, not yet legal, we will need to support and nurture grassroots integration networks and online networks for people to, to find each other and support each other and access expert input as well. And also, I think we need to have more balanced information to the public that foregrounds the possibility of these very dark, harrowing experiences so that people are less likely to be very gung-ho and take huge doses alone. I think we've swung after all the kind of... Um, the scare stories of the 60s and 70s, I think now we're kind of, we're going so far in the other direction that we want to show the, the positive side and the safety and the light and the sunshine. And we are, we are, I think, avoiding a bit of the, of the frightening nature that these experiences can, can be. And I think we maybe need to, yeah, look into that a bit. The other type of darkness we're avoiding is that the dominant narratives right now suggest that one psychedelic therapy experience can cure depression. In our trial, the end point was at six weeks. So six weeks after their psilocybin session, they finished. It was actually only three weeks after their second session. So they had a session, three weeks, then they had another session, and then three weeks. So only three weeks after their second session, that was the end point. That was when the final outcome measures were taken. So to use the season analogy, of the four seasons, those measures to say how effective the trial had been were taken when people were in high summer, just three weeks afterwards. There are some studies where one or two sessions, psilocybin sessions, is enough for long-term remission of depression. But crucially, these studies are looking at depression secondary to a terminal illness diagnosis, which is a very different thing. And I think for most people with major depression, severe, long-standing chronic depression, I don't think that one or two sessions will lead to long-term change. I think those deep wounds will need ongoing excavation. And I think that rather than the narrative of the miracle cure or hopes for eternal sunshine, nature's narrative is much more accurate. Even the darkest night of the soul can be moved on from. After the very deepest winter comes spring. Hellish trips can be healed with the right people around you. And for someone with depression, after the most wonderful psilocybin session and the expansion and connectedness that can follow after that high summer, will come autumn and will come winter, probably. And in the psilocybin for depression studies, many people who had previously been in a winter that lasted years felt the kiss of the sun, and that's a beautiful thing. But we owe it to them to acknowledge that that sun probably won't last forever, and that rather than ignoring that the darkness returns and pretending it doesn't, I think we can build communities for embarking on the long journey in and through the cycles of light and dark, expansion and contraction, a pack of co-travellers who understand what each other are going through and help each other to keep going through the darkness, the light, to keep going through these cycles. So on to the next na nature code. Nature is slow. When we walk in the woods, the trees we love are the big old ones, the ones that have lived through storms, they're missing some branches, they're not the perfect straight up and down ones. We gravitate to the wonky ones, there is great beauty in a novelly, gnarly, wise old tree. I think the way psychedelics can heal us is that in the right container, 
they can help us become a bit more like that tree that gradually, slowly over time, repeated sessions and lots of integration, we can slowly accept our wonky bits, sharp bits, the places we lost branches in the storms, accepting our imperfections as what makes us who we are because faults and wounds that have been fully faced and integrated become character. But it takes a long time to become a wise old tree, a lot of learning, a lot of healing, and a lot of time. One of the rules of trees is that the deeper the roots, the stronger the branches. It probably took this oak tree 200 years to grow. They gradually become home to a huge ecosystem of insects, fungi, animals, birds, and their wide branches sustain life. You contrast this to a eucalyptus tree plantation. These grow up very fast. Their wood is very soft and flammable. And there have been huge forest fires in eucalyptus plantations. The current excitement about psychedelics means that there is huge sudden growth in this new industry. So many psychedelic startups, so many new retreat centers, and I work for one of them. Synthesis is a psychedelic startup. And I don't have deep roots in this work. I trained in the Western clinical psychology model. I grew up in a culture which taught me nothing about psychedelics except that they were dangerous. And then I got very excited by the potential of psychedelics and became a session guide without really much idea about what I was doing. I am a eucalyptus tree. All of us in the Imperial team were. We called on an experienced supervisor who'd been working with altered states for decades, but even still, there were so many moments in sessions where we really felt way over our heads. This was a way of working that was so different to where we'd been trained, what we'd been trained to do as clinicians, and we didn't really understand it. We were fast growing eucalyptus trees without deep roots or strong branches, but we wanted to be oaks. So how to be more oak or more redwood? Well, first to acknowledge the real ancient oaks and redwoods who have lived whole lives in communities which have carried the art of psychedelic healing, whose whole lives have been about apprenticeship to these medicines, who've developed careful time-worn practices to maintain the safety and sanctity of the tradition, and have sat through thousands of ceremonies and have been taught by their elders and teachers about what to do in different situations and what different things might mean. I'll come back to this point a bit later, but now back to this idea of how us newcomers can become more oak and less eucalyptus. We can seek apprenticeship and know that apprenticeship is slow. Deep roots and strong branches take time. And we can be very aware of our limitations and know that for us newcomers, there's a kind of honeymoon period with psychedelics. For the first few years, it's magic and it's going to change the world. But then you start to see the shadow, the rampant problem of psychedelic narcissism, the self-appointed healers, the lure of power. It's a bit like the power of the ring in Lord of the Rings. And that's all tinder for forest fires. To stand strong in the face of that, working with a level of consciousness that we have no long-standing tradition in understanding and all the power problems that can come from working with these tools when you don't have a deep apprenticeship. I think we need to build really serious network structures for facilitators across clinical research, retreats, and indigenous settings. Maybe an annual gathering where people who facilitate sessions or who are training to be facilitators can share stories and cases. Or a monthly Zoom group where facilitators talk and learn from each other, maybe with experienced mentors offering their reflections too. In our practitioner training at Synthesis that we've just started, it's not just about teaching the students content. It's about supporting a community to become strongly bonded, embody these principles of ongoing apprenticeship together to remind each other to be oaks, not eucalyptus, and to learn how to carry the ring without putting it on your own hand. There's a paper there at the bottom uh, by a colleague, Chris Timmerman, and all about psychedelic apprenticeship and how we can grow these deep roots. So I think that's the risk with us fast growing startups and retreats, this uh, the eucalyptus plantation that, that shoot up fast and are very flammable. But what about the other end of the spectrum? What about a plant that takes over the whole forest? Now the last nature code, 
diversity and reciprocity. The rhododendron is a beautiful plant that was introduced to the UK by the Victorians because it's so pretty. The flowers are very impressive, but it became invasive. Rhododendrons will outcompete many native trees and shrubs and can harbor plant diseases. Nothing eats it. It doesn't contribute to the diversity. It actually undermines the diversity because as it grows and spreads, it shades out other plants and trees. And because nothing eats it, nothing is keeping its rampant growth in check. The rhododendron has destroyed habitats. It looks very pretty, but it's taken over and whole colonies of plants and animals have disappeared where it has been introduced. And because it's so expensive to control and because it physically prevents access, land has been abandoned. And rhododendron also coils the soil around it so nothing can grow afterwards for up to seven years after it's gone. I think this is a metaphor for corporations entering the field and aggressive patenting strategies, which are the modus operandi of corporations because they have a legal obligation to maximize profits. And I think there are two main tragedies with the rhododendron scenario. The first tragedy is that it's in the diversity of an ecosystem that we find its resilience, health, and creativity. The psychedelic ecosystem needs lots of different species, biodiversity. We need the scientists and the doctors, but we also need the cardinal trees, the elders, the storytellers, the nurses, energy healers, musicians, politicians, lawyers, artists, chaplains, people that can make money and fund things. We need each person to stand on the little patch of earth that they have deep roots in, they have deep apprenticeship in, and offer that little patch to the whole. Not to try to take it all over, not to think our perspective is the only way of knowing. We have the key or the permission, we have the most important lens and narrative. Biodiversity in nature is about cross-pollination, the magic that comes from difference, the richness that comes from all the different colors, the way nature is like an orchestra. And I've so loved working with the lead facilitators at Synthesis. So Dan is a psychedelic chaplain, Natasha is an energy healer, James is a psychotherapist. They're all so good at what they do, all different, all offering something really unique, but synthesizing together. And I think Oregon is an inspiration on how they are setting up 109 because they're really respecting diversity, honoring the many ways of knowing and preventing med medicalized monoculture. The other thing to say about diversity is that the mainstream representation of the psychedelic renaissance, as well as being very clinical, is very white. And at Synthesis, we're nearly all white, but we now have a diversity director who in our new hiring decisions will be suggesting white thought candidates. The second tragedy around a rhododendron takeover, it's not just that it wipes out the older trees, it's that it extracts from them first. That rich soil where the old trees stood, the rhododendron sucks that rich compost up to nourish itself. The old trees, the communities who've been working with plant medicines for many generations or at least many decades, we have all extracted from them. We owe so much to those who passed on these traditions, kept them going, built safe containers and apprenticeship. The Western clinical model is based on the work of underground therapists and their work is based on the work of indigenous healers. Mazatec healers carried this work safely through the Spanish Inquisition. They carried the flame. And I wonder how it must be for them to see psilocybin therapy patented, that they don't stand to share in any of the profits of their legacy. But even worse, they don't get to have a voice in that narrative. They don't get to say. To me, it's almost like they were the guardians of this precious child. They even called the mushrooms little children. <clears throat> and now, does it feel to them that after all those years of guardianship, the child is kind of adopted away and suddenly they have no say in how that child grows up? And we can say, oh, well, but you know, we're just doing it our way. They can do it their way. We're not stopping them. But I think as this statement um, from the Maztec shows that it's not as simple as that. So I'll, I'll leave that for a moment to you to read.
So I've worked with psilocybin for six years now, and I've never asked a Mazatec healer about it or really considered the impact on them of the Western psychedelic science renaissance. And looking back now, I think it's strange that there is this group of people who've been doing this work for so long, who we owe for the existence of synthetic psilocybin, and whose deeply rooted tradition carries on today, and they have so much experience, and yet they haven't been included in the dominant narrative around psilocybin. Is it because they have a different perspective on how mushrooms work and we don't want to hear it? Maybe. It's hard to know how to synthesize. It's hard to know how to begin to listen. There's a project being planned to preserve the knowledge of the Mazatec elders, and I hope that this and other projects like it will be crucial to the wholesome growth of the psychedelic healing mission. I also just read the open letter to the psychedelic movement regarding POT and policy efforts and how to be an ally to indigenous peoples of North America by the Indigenous POT Conservation Communication Committee. Really important. And I hope we can find a way for the leaders of all the different groups of people who care about psychedelics, so indigenous groups, retreat centers, academics, clinicians, <clears throat> and many others, to come together in some way to work out how to actually be an ecosystem, a real ecosystem, how to let ourselves be joined by the mycelium underneath us. If we want psychedelics to play a part in changing the world, we have to let them change us first. And I'm looking at myself. I haven't lived by these nature codes. I haven't allowed myself to go slowly or to have winters where I rest and I'm not productive. I've been striving and seeking. I've been looking at things through my own perspective and not listening to other worldviews enough. But since joining Synthesis, which is a community that that does really honor the many ways of knowing, the nature codes have started to shape me more, which I'm very grateful for. And I will just leave with this quote, a beautiful quote from Joseph Campbell. The goal of life is to make your heartbeat match the beat of the universe, to match your nature with nature. So we will be publishing our code of ethics soon. Um, and there will be some other updates from us about our vision and our plans in line with these, with these um, nature codes. And also the, the connectedness measure validation paper will be submitted soon. And if anyone would like to use it before then, you can email the email address at the bottom there, my colleague Sam, and um, who will be on the panel for this conference talking about nature connectedness. Um, and yeah, you can email him and he can send you a copy in, in advance of the publication. So that's it for me. Thank you very much.